This week on Kentucky Afield. Now look, this is a big bull. <laughs> We're in the hills of Eastern Kentucky for the opening weekend of bull elk firearm season, catching up with biologists, conservation officers, and hunters. Then, uh -oh. perhaps the best time of the year to target trophy smallmouth bass is right around the corner. We'll show you one of our favorite techniques. Gotta find the food bar. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Say Leo. Yeah, we're here to get the keeper. Here it goes. Boom. Oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. This year on our bull elk season, we decided to do something a little bit different. We tagged along with a conservation officer and a biologist to see what they do during the elk season. Today is September 25th. It's the opening day of bull elk firearm season in Kentucky. We're currently in unit six in Martin County on the Czar track, which is one of our regulated areas. We're going to be trying to conduct some compliance checks and just patrol. We get a lot of trespassing complaints because there's railroad tracks and they'll put in at a different holler and ride the tracks up and get on the property. These are the, uh, the tracks trespassers usually take to enter the property illegally. We just saw two hunters on a ridge uh, overlooking one of the hollow fields out here. We're gonna try to find a way to get to their vehicle and find out how they went in and try to do a compliance check on them. Uh, it looks like they were in compliance with the hunter orange requirement. Um, so we're gonna go see how they're doing this morning. You know, when we come up on these vehicles, we're gonna check and make sure that they've got their, their hang tags. They get those from our website once they purchase their elk permit and they're required to hang them in their windshield while they're hunting. which I'm not currently seeing. Okay. All right, we'll park here and walk in and see how they're doing. We just tried to conduct a compliance check on the two vehicles we saw on the hunters on a ridge. It ended up being the landowners that wasn't hunting. They informed us that they've had some recent trespassing issues, so they brought us out here to where the people are known to hunt. We're gonna go out here and see if we can find any kind of bait or cameras or any sign that they've been hunting illegally and try to make contact with them if they're there. Well, Joe, we're here in Eastern Kentucky and another elk season is here. How many elk seasons have you worked now? I think this makes seven or eight for me. Okay. So we've been collecting data on elk since before they even got to Kentucky. And we are still in the process of learning what makes a healthy elk herd, right? Mm -hmm. What are you collecting today? So today what we did, we took a liver sample to help us gauge some different mineral levels. You know, we are in an area where the strip mine activities have occurred that there could be some heavy metal built up. So we're trying to collect these liver samples to help us establish a baseline for what normal levels are. Mm -hmm. And we're pulling teeth like you all have seen us do before. These are for agent harvest metrics to help us kind of get an idea of how old the elk are that we're harvesting, get a good age distribution. We also, today, this is a new one for us this year, we're collecting bull testicles to help one of our sister agencies in Pennsylvania with an ongoing research project that they have. 
They're curious if maybe there could be some issues with the sperm quality in those animals, probably related to the number of founders that they started their population with. And we're trying to serve as a kind of a control for them to see if there's any difference in the quality here on our animals. Pennsylvania is a state that does have elk. They're also involved in this liver deal as well. So you can take their data and compare it to our data and that kind of helps you gauge what's healthy and what's not. Yes, so like if you go to a doctor's office and get a blood panel analysis, they can tell you, okay, your sugar is within this level. It's high or it's low. We don't really have a lot of those reference ranges for elk. So that's one of the main reasons we're trying to look at the liver stuff. And we're getting these samples from Pennsylvania as well, because they don't really have as much mining activity in that area. So we're kind of helping build a bigger reference range to see if there is an effect of heavy metals in the ground here or not. We just got a complaint that there's two groups of ATV riders on the property illegal. You know, obviously we know all the hunters that were selected for this area and there's no ATV use on this property. So this is not gonna be our hunters and it's not gonna be anybody with permission to be here. So currently we're following the landowner to the area where was a group of hunters had called in and reported seeing the side by side. And hopefully we can try to catch them and find out who they are and what they're doing. That's why we was with the landowner. He was showing us places where side by sides had been coming in and we walked the area to try to find signs of them. And then as soon as we got done there, we got this call. So we're really trying to figure out if it might be something related or how close it is to the area that they've been having problems before. One of the hunters, that, that's one of the, the people that's with a hunter. I recognize him. I'm not sure who they were. <laughs> we'll have to sort all this out once we get everything squared away. Hey guys, how y'all doing? You all know you all's on are, you know, for a long ways back there. They don't allow any kind of ATVs and stuff. Are y'all hunting or just out riding? No, it's riding. It looks like they were just joy riders. I don't see any kind of firearms. No sign that they're up here trying to illegally hunt. Uh, but still, it's the opening day of elk season. They have no permission to be here, and this property doesn't allow any kind of ATV use. You know, they're complying and everything, and they understand that they're not supposed to be here now. So we're going to issue them citations to them on the way. Y'all know it's the opening day of elk season, don't you? I have no idea. Didn't know? Okay. Well, what it is, there's people, you know, back here that got drew for czar, and you know, they're the ones that called and complained the side sides are driving by and all that stuff. Um, the two, op two operators, you're going to be charged with ATV violations and, you know, criminal trespassing. Thank you all, and be careful. I'm just glad we caught up to them and educated them. And hopefully we won't have no dealings with them for the rest of elk season. Now look, this is a big bull. <laughs> so you got this bull this morning, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you actually are from Hazard, Kentucky, so right here in Eastern Kentucky. Yeah. You get to see elk around here very often? Mm, yeah, kinda. You ever see them this big? Uh, yeah, sometimes. You have, okay, all right. So it wasn't like a, a brand new experience for you, yeah. but hunting elk, this is your first elk hunt, right? Yeah. Man, this is such a nice, big animal. Collecting data is very, very important to a biologist, right? Mm -hmm. So you got a couple different ways you can collect it. One is on the hoof, and you collect some of that data based on range and how far they're moving with the GPS collars, mm -hmm. which we saw one of those today. One of these elk at the camp today was a collared animal. We always try to get these back from our hunters if we can. A lot of times we're able to reuse them and put them out on other animals for further research efforts. It's pretty cool too for the hunters that do harvest these. A lot of times we've got a lot of information on the animals. We can kind of give you history we have on them. Like for instance, this bull here was captured about three years ago, not too far from the property it was harvested on. And we can kind of give these guys a, just a little bit of background about how old he is, things like that. Yeah, obviously safety is our number one goal. We want to maintain a high compliance while we're out doing compliance checks on the public. Uh, we really want to make sure everybody's following hunter orange requirements. That includes a hat and a vest visible, you know, 360 degrees, chest and back. That is awesome. Thank you. I'm Officer Field Park Fish and Wildlife. John Perkins. Nice to meet you. By this point in the elk season, you know, we expect all hunters to already have their hunting license. Let's see what your hunting license is. Yes, sir. 
you got your home education card in there, I think we'll get yes, it. Yes, sir. Over. It's a little beat up. Uh oh. Okay. We'd like to see the completion of the hunter education card and have that on their persons while they're in the field. And that applies to everybody born after January 1st, 1975. There it is. There's the license confirmation numbers on the back of it. And once you've bought your hunting license, you put in for the elk permit, and you've been drawn, they have to still go back on there and buy their elk permit and have that with them in the field as well. All right. Is your weapon unloaded over here? Yes, sir. It's important that they use the right equipment. Right now it's rifle season, so they're going to need to have a caliber 270 or larger. If they're using a detachable magazine or something, you know, that would be able to hold more ammunition. It has to be a magazine not able to hold more than 10 rounds. Nice gun. If you're going to use a shotgun, it's got to be of at least 20 gauge firing a single projectile, so that would be like a slug or a sabot. Muzzle loaders of at least 50 caliber. No full autos, no full metal jackets, no tracer ammunition. Thank you, sir. Awesome. No problem. That is a beautiful elk. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's the elk of a lifetime. We you think he'll score. The guys that was helping me out, they think around 370-ish maybe. A lot of people might not know that these regulated areas are privately owned and they all have their own set of regulations. You can go on our website and type in the name of the track you're going to be hunting and it'll give you a property description, whether it allows ATVs, whether it don't allow ATVs. It's illegal to hunt elk over bait. Uh, it, in many of our regulated areas, it's illegal to bait, period, even for deer. Uh, it's important to keep that in mind. And the biggest thing about being a successful hunter is when you find out that you've been drawn and where you're drawn for, that's really where your hunt needs to begin. We came out the Saturday of Labor Day weekend, my wife and I scouted and I had the Argus map with the boundaries and everywhere I'd find sign, I would mark it. So I would suggest coming down and scouting the day before, make sure you're in the right place and know where you're gonna hunt, know the boundary lines. That just takes a lot of the guesswork out once you get in the field. It makes you much more likely to be successful. <laughs> Congratulations. Nice Thank you, sir. It's good to meet you. So how far of a shot did you have to take? 65 yards. 65 yards. Now, have you been practicing with your rifle for quite a while before the hunt? Yeah. So what kind of gun are you shooting? 300 short mag. A 300 short mag. That's a good round. That's one that'll put them down. Tell me about this hunt. When you got out there, did you have to sit out there very long, or was it quick, or how long did it take? Mm, I'd have to say 45 minutes to get all the way up there and walk. Did you hear the bull bugle, or how did it happen? It bugled, and then we scooted up some more, and then it was down the hill, and then he got the shooting sticks, Okay. and he set it up and he said, shoot it. You had a guide with you today, and they took some shooting sticks. They probably kind of had seen this bull and knew you were in the right area, and got in there and made some bugles, and he answered you? Yeah. Got in there at 65 yards, got your shooting sticks out. So I guess you drug this out by yourself, didn't you? No. No? <laughs> well, it's been a great day to get out and see some elk. You know, we've obviously seen some in the field and some that have been harvested. Hopefully you collected the data samples today that can only make for a healthier herd in the future. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking us out. Yeah, man, had a good time. Located approximately 40 miles north of Bowling Green, Kentucky, and just a stone's throw away from Mammoth Cave National Park is the Nolan River Wildlife Management Area. This WMA is comprised of 6,400 acres of land bordering the Nolan River Lake. It's owned by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and managed for hunting and fishing opportunities by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Nolan River Lake WMA offers excellent hunting opportunities for deer, turkey, and small game. The best access to the WMA is by boat or by permission of a private landowner to cross their property to the adjacent WMA. The property contains a mixture of wooded areas with some tracts of cleared fields and wildlife food plots. In addition to hunting, Nolan River Lake offers bountiful opportunities for fishing, boating, and other water activities. Remember that wildlife management area users must abide by the Kentucky Trapping hunting, and fishing regulations. Also keep in mind that regulations on WMAs often differ from statewide regulations, so be sure to review the hunting guide or website for the specific WMA that you are hunting. For more information about this WMA or the latest regulations and restrictions that pertain to it, visit our website at fw.ky.gov or call 1-800-858-1549. Winters here in Kentucky are not only a great time to go hunting, but they can be a fantastic time to catch a big fish.
Oh, what a beautiful day. Now this is a, it's a fantastic lake to catch, you know, good, good size smallmouth and trophy smallmouth. Obviously the world record from here. But this lake gets a lot of pressure now. Yeah. To, to come yeah. here and try to catch a eight or nine, 10 pounder, I mean, that's a fish yeah. of a lifetime. I've fished this lake a lot and I've never, I've never broken uh, eight pounds. And I don't know if yeah. I've had a seven pounder, but the lake is, is fishing really, really, really good right now. Yes. So hopefully, I'm gonna try to throw some swim baits, some jigs, maybe some blade baits, but I'm gonna start throwing a swim bait and uh, see if we can't catch some fish. What do you think? Uh, we can do it, let's go. All right. I will tell you, this time of year, our water temperature is 46 degrees. It's all about a real slow presentation. And a lot of times, when we catch fish down here this time of year, the bites are not aggressive. It doesn't feel like you're catching a four pound fish when you first get a bite. It's, really? It feels like you're getting a bluegill just pecking it. And you're like, man, these little fish are driving me nuts. Well, they're not little fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, okay. they're big fish. There we go. There you go. Now, you want to establish a food source? Check this out. How about that? <laughs> now, you think they're actively feeding? Their mouth is plumb full <laughs> of shad. Shad. How about that? We got about an 18-inch fish there. We've been here five minutes. We now know they're feeding yeah. on shad actively, and we're sitting in between 35 and 40 feet of water, and we're catching fish in 15 to 18 feet. So, hey, now yeah. we're on to something. <laughs> we just run around and do this all day. <laughs> You need a net? I don't think he's that big. Sometimes they get bigger when they get to the boat, though. Not a bad fish. He's a lot fatter than the last one. That's a healthy fish there. Yeah. That's a thicker fish than the last one. Yeah. Probably about the same length. You know, we're looking at that 18, 19 inch fish. 18 and a little bit. You would expect a fish that size when it hits your bait to just about pull your paw out of your hand. Yep. That was this. Did you? That was it. June, June they will, 2.30 <laughs> 2 in the morning. Yeah, they absolutely will. It'll get a little bigger. So when you first started fishing down here, how often did you guys throw soft plastics? We was throwing mostly a spinner bait. I fished with uh, Ernie Taylor. He guided down here quite a bit. And when we first started fishing down here, we would find the grass and get out at, right at the very end of it, at 25, 28 foot deep. And then we went to different times, jig or, or the plastic. We got a rod bender. Yeah, he was way out here. Oh, I didn't get that little brownie. I, I believe I found one of them old large men. Oh, sure did. How did you do that? Very carefully. <laughs> Typically, for me, it's about one large mouth for every 20 small mouth, but. Well, you wouldn't leave me no small mouth, so I just had to catch a <laughs> large mouth. Next. <laughs> hey, we need your brown cousin. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty healthy fish, though. Turn it loose, I'm gonna get this 10 pounder out here. All right. Well, oh, there, there you go. Goes. I might want to grab the net on this one, Daryl, if you don't mind. How can you believe that? So I cast it up in here, and there's a lot of rock that's uh, pretty easy to get hung on. Hooked on that rock, was shaking that off, and got on the back side. When I snapped it free, I thought Daryl would hook my line because I felt it make that motion. Went ahead and set the hook, <laughs> and uh, that's what hit it. 20 and a little more and a half. Almost, nice. Nice. almost 21 inches. That's a really good fish right there. Get that one back in the water. Yep. What I'm throwing here is just this little, uh, it's a 3 8 ounce tungsten lure. Throwing this little swim bait here. I'm throwing this exposed. Run this bait on there. And these, uh, these swing impact fats have a little area where you bring your hook up through. What this thing does is it goes down and it sets and when I start to pull it, it comes up like this, and very little motion will get that tail making this move. And then I'll pull it across the bottom, I'll stand it back up. The reason it doesn't feel like a big 
strike is because those fish, it's catching their attention, and they're just picking it up. And when they pick it up, you'll feel something very, very slight. If you're not using a really sensitive rod and fluorocarbon line, you may not feel it at all. You'll just all of a sudden notice there's no bait. When that happens, then you've had a strike. Uh-oh. Need a net? No, I don't know. I don't know what I need. I don't know what it is. It looks oh, yeah. like it's the right color. A 10 pound Ooh. test line, you might. He's the right color. There you go. Yeah, he's out here deep. He's out here out pulling real so Boy, look how light colored he is. Now I'll tell you, we ran all over the lake today and we pulled back in. We can literally see the boat ramp fishing some grass and, and here they here they sit. They're right here beside us. That's a nice fish though. Yeah. Like I say, and you and you see that this time of year, you start to see yeah. when they come up, you'll see some that are really colored up and then you'll get a really pale colored fish like this. And these are yeah. fish that have been in deep, deep dark, water, cold water coming up. and they're just coming up. Thank you there, the little fish. He was ready to get going. You gotta find the lounge to where they're at at the airport. <laughs> Got to find the food bar. I'm pretty good at finding it. <laughs> oh, missed him. Just got polarized. Oh, came back and hit it. Get ready. Look at that. That's when they're starting to get more aggressive right there. When you swing on one and miss, and he comes running back and hits it again, that's when you know they're starting to get aggressive. Daryl, this might be a pretty good fish. Whoa! Grab that net there if you don't mind. Oh, I just happened to have it this time. Yeah, this old boy ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Thank you. That is a nice one there. Now this one here. That's the best one of the day. This one here has got some girth to it. Not that terribly long, but look how thick and healthy this smallmouth here is. 20 and a quarter. Four pounds, eight ounces. All right. That's a beauty. That right there is the reason you come to Del Hollow catch you big fish like that. Thank you, buddy. Away he goes. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have two-year-old Walker Donnelly from Smith Grove, Kentucky, helping his dad on a family dove hunt in Edmondson County. Nice job. Here we have Molly Kramer, and this is her first deer ever taken with a bow. She took this massive deer in Mason County, Kentucky. Congratulations. Here we have Nicholas Morgan with a nice three pound bass that he caught in his neighbor's farm pond. Nice job. Here we have three year old Haiti Hilleman who caught her first fish ever, a nice bluegill that was caught in her family's pond. She caught this fish on her Paw Patrol fishing rod. Check out this beautiful largemouth bass that was caught by Blake Russell. He's from Mount Washington, Kentucky, and this fish was caught at Rough River Lake using a crankbait. Check out the tines on this deer that was taken by seven-year-old Barrett Fletcher from Nelson County. He took his first buck ever during the youth season on his pop and Mimi's farm. 36-year-old Michael Dunn decided this was gonna be the year he takes up bow hunting, and he took this nice doe in Washington County. Nice job. Here we have 10-year-old Colton with his first deer ever, a nice buck that was taken on his dad's property in Campbell County. This is Joe Vickers of Cincinnati, Ohio, who was fishing for stripers at Lake Cumberland and caught this lake sturgeon. This fish was released immediately. Here we have nine-year-old Archer White, who took his first deer ever. He took this nice eight-point buck in Sadieville, Kentucky, while using a crossbow. Nice job. Kentucky's deer hunting season will come and go. But Kentucky is also a great place to grab a pair of binoculars and take in some of the migratory birds that winter here. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. If you hold a Kentucky hunting or fishing license, then you have helped make possible Kentucky's wildlife management areas, places to hunt, fish, bird watch or just let your mind wander with nearly 100 dotting the commonwealth put wildlife management areas in your sights and see more of what makes kentucky's outdoors outstanding get all the info online at fw.kentucky.gov
www.ky.gov. Let's go. More Kentucky Afield is available at your fingertips. Whether by smartphone or computer, you'll find exclusive content and behind the scenes videos on our social media pages. Give us a like or follow to stay in the woods and on the water longer. When you subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, just search Kentucky Afield on your favorite app.